Hi, welcome to Human Resources Management. This is Lecture 8A. In today's lecture, we're going to be looking at staffing, recruitment, and training. Uh, just to start off with staffing and recruitment, there we've been talking in this course or discussing uh, the aspects of creating a culture and what it's like to hire people and retain people. We've talked about some of the advantages of amortization of uh, hiring costs over a period of time. Same thing goes with training. So uh, when we think about uh, that aspect, there is a lot of cost and effort that's expended in the recruitment of new employees. Sometimes we don't really realize how much cost is put into that effort. And in some jobs, indeed, there's a lot more cost and effort put into it than other jobs. You know, there's the cost of advertising, how much, it, you know, to recruit people if we're actually posting in different locations. Uh, there's if we hire a separate firm uh, that is actually utilized, especially with key management positions or key positions that's actually hired to go out there and recruit people for this position. Uh, often in the industry, it's uh, referred to as headhunting, where you're trying to hire somebody away from their current position to come to uh, your company, uh, which can sometimes can be challenging. Uh, the cost and time of the hiring committee and the number of interviews that's involved, uh, the cost and time of the HR department that's also involved in the reprocess. And then when you finally get them hired, then you have to train them. So you definitely don't want to do this uh, ongoing if you don't need to. Like You don't want to hire somebody, recruit somebody in, only to have them not be happy or satisfied and leave the company within a short period of time. That's generally not in your best interest. Uh, so if you get the right people on the bus, you want to keep them on the bus. And that requires a lot of time and effort too. Uh, so what... What sort of workplace does the company want? And that ties to what we talked about in the earlier lectures when we talked about developing a strategy that's going to tie with your business. And we even talked about the tactics of trying to uh, achieve the strategy and the goals. So it's good to have an understanding at heart what the business is trying to achieve. It makes it easier when you're trying to uh, recruit people. Are they in alignment with what the overall firm's goals are? Uh, so, uh, what type of business uh, are we in? Do we have more career-oriented employees? I've got lifetime employees there. I'm not going to say lifetime, really, you know, really, or, but is it a career-type job? Are people uh, well-rooted with your company? Do they feel a sense of loyalty with your company? Hard to say lifetime these days, but definitely longer-term employees, especially when we're talking in fields of engineering and that type of uh, work. Uh, there's always a lot more dedication, skills, uh, and loyalty requirements that are involved in those particular areas. Diversity of workforce. Uh, there may be legal uh, requirements uh, with regards to diversity of workforce. There may be um, important uh, for the firm to have good representation uh, of the people that they serve. Um, so when we talk about diversity of workforce, we have to ensure that we're representing the people that uh, and businesses that we're dealing with in that sense. So is our is our fee, is our employee workforce um, kind of a one demographic? That's you got to ask questions. Why is that? What's going on? And are we fully representative of the people that we're serving so we can better serve them so that we can ensure that. Uh, we better understand their problems. And if we have a global reach, do we have a global representation that way? So these are things that are, come into consideration as well. How does the business encourage the right sort of people to apply? Uh, again, uh, using hiring firms or employment firms um, you know, to uh, help us and assist us to do that. That may be one of the things that we look at. Uh, there's also word of mouth and coworker referrals. So word of mouth is your boss asks you, do you know anybody uh, that might qualify for this? I've seen this happen many times over the years where groups of students that work together in their projects at college and university 
uh, they end up working together in the same firms. How does that happen? Well, one gets in, uh, they know that they're hiring, they let the other person know or they let their boss know, and there's a connection point there. Uh, that's how Google originally actually expanded uh, rapidly was where they would ask their employees, uh, do you know somebody? They even had sort of hiring uh, bonuses if the, one of the referrals that an employee gave was actually hired, uh, then they would get a certain amount of money for that process. Uh, there's a downside to that. And at a certain point, I think with Google, because they were hiring so fast, uh, they weren't able to keep up. So they had to look at a lot of different other avenues in there. Uh, advertising. So of course, uh, firms can advertise and uh, they can advertise in trade magazines. They can advertise online in lots of areas uh, where they're trying to recruit. Uh, so there's all kinds of different avenues online for advertising. Uh, what are they offering as far as wages, benefits, and training? That can be attractive. That can make it easier to attract people. Uh, the aspect of, you know, having the company be in the top 100 employers, let's say. There's all kinds of employer ratings out there. And a lot of the, the best and brightest companies like to be included in that so that they can say, we're in Canada's top 100 uh, companies. Uh, so if you're in the top 100, that's attractive and they'll market that and they'll put that in their web page and they'll put that in their uh, letterhead and they'll put that in anything that they're actually uh, posting online so that it's sort of a branding situation for the company so that uh, that can be attractive to the best and brightest uh, of people that way. So wages, benefits, job security, those types of things can be attractive. And some of those things tie with extrinsic rewards that we talked about. Some of them tie with intrinsic rewards that we've discussed. And that's also trying to position the company that it's getting applications from the best people. Remember what we discussed earlier on. If you, know, if you can get the best people on the bus, it's a lot easier when you don't have to motivate them. They're already really motivated. You just have to set the parameters that ensures that they don't get demotivated. So that's a, a, a plus for firms in that respect. And of course, when you're hiring, you don't always want to hire people with the same kind of viewpoint. That can be a problem too, because it can elicit groupthink. Everybody thinks the same way, and that means you might not see the forest for the trees. You might not see change that is occurring. Um, so a good diversity of thought uh, can also help be a catalyst for being able to adapt and be able, being able to respond to changes in the marketplace, which we've discussed because change is such a rapid uh, process these days. So uh, really you wanna think about things in those uh, terms and you don't wanna hire everybody that's just like you. You wanna make sure that you have that diversity of thought and um, you want your business to be a reflection of the people that you hire. Staff retention. So what are some of the things that allows us to retain staff? I kind of like this chart on the right, just overhead uh, that I have uh, here and sort of branches out into staff retention in two areas that we can think about, turnover and burnout. So uh, when we think about burnout, we think about people that there's a depersonalization. And of course, we've looked at things like Taylorism, uh, taken to the nth degree uh, and um, stressful uh, situations or stressful, stressful, uh, unsolved uh, intra-team conflicts, organizational pressures uh, that really sort of are ongoing and lengthy, that can really sort of lead to uh, burnout of individuals, long hours, um, no breaks in between. Uh, dissatisfaction, discomfort, unrealistic, unmeaning goals, unfair financial rewards, distributive and procedural justice, uh, relationship problems, difficulties with the teams. And part of that might be with uh, reward systems uh, that are um, not really reflective of team-based work. Lack of opportunity for promotion. In, so the internal labor markets may be lacking. Uh, and uh, lacking in areas of helping to uh, set pathways for individuals so there's no opportunities for improvements. And unreasonable challenges, goals that uh, really are demotivating because there's not the expectation that they can be uh, 
accomplished. accomplished. So you're not going to see value in trying to reach those goals uh, when there's no ex expectancy or instrumentality there. So those are some things that obviously uh, will pay into an individual's motivation and people that become demotivated much more easily burn out and there's much higher turnover. Why do I want to stay in a firm where uh, I'm not appreciated and there's expectations that are unrealistic? There's better places to work. So uh, that usually gives a good sort of indication of uh, things to avoid uh, and things that if they're building up in a firm, how can we uh, develop the internal requirements that would lessen those impacts and remove those impacts and avoid them altogether indeed. So uh, how do we find new employees? Uh, in order to find new employees, uh, you have to put yourself in their shoes and you have to look at it from uh, their perspective. So uh, you need to know what employees are looking for. What are the things that uh, employees might value uh, as far as being hired from a company. So hearing that that company is one of Canada's 100 top employers, what does that mean? Uh, does that mean employees are generally more satisfied with their work? And if they're more satisfied with their work, why are they more satisfied? Usually they're satisfied with the benefits. Usually they're satisfied with the other uh, employee teams and management in the company. Uh, that plays a role. Usually they have a lot of autonomy and self-satisfaction. When we looked at high commitment organizations, very often those are the organizations that uh, do well in these rating systems of top employers, whether it's Canada's top 100 employers, whether it's top 100 employers in the GTA, uh, whatever that may be. So development of a job description uh, that helps to define uh, that uh, what an applicant should have that's got clarity, transparency there, that's realistic, uh, that doesn't sell a bill of goods that's not true. Uh, that's always a, a problem too. Uh, so you, it needs to be broad enough that it captures uh, the job. Sometimes you don't want it too specific because things change all the time, job, job roles change. So you want it to be encapsulating what the job is without being, you know, too too prescribed that it's too detailed that as soon as things change it's not necessarily true and you want it to be uniform across the consistency aspect so if that position is offered many many times within your firm you want to make sure there's some uniformity and consistency there so that people know what to expect and uh, you have to determine experience requirements. Uh, what is uh, the required experience level for somebody to be successful at this job? And if we make it too high, then we may not get all the applicants that uh, we would like to vet for this particular job. Same with education. It's nice to say everybody should have a PhD, but if the job doesn't require a PhD, we've ruled out a lot of potentially really good applicants. Because remember, it's it's also what can the person and individual do? What can they accomplish? What are their abilities at? So we have to be kind of careful when we hire that we don't set the bar too high with educational requirements. A lot of the uh, dot-com companies have kind of discovered this, that uh, if they set the bar too high edu on educational requirements, they maybe miss somebody whose heart and soul is involved in computer programming, and maybe they don't have all the necessary degrees, but because they've spent thousands of hours, because this is what they love, uh, they're missing that individual, which would be at the detriment of a company in that case. You know, if you're really passionate about something, you tend to do really well in that area because you can smoke everybody else because you're willing to spend thousands and thousands of hours bettering yourself in that particular area. I've seen that with students in certain areas, especially with certain uh, software programs. You know, they're better than the teacher because they've spent thousands of hours, day and night, day and night, working on that. They may not have the same kind of credentials, but they can really utilize that specific area. So you have to consider that. What, what does the role really require? and they are not going too far above that it's ruling out a lot of potentially good uh, employees. So that's a consideration that needs a lot of thought process when developing the um, 
actual job descriptions that you're after and when people are applying what the minimum requirements are. At the same time, you don't want it so low that you have a million, you know, you have a million applicants and it's like, how do we sift through all this? You want to have some way of vetting it, and narrowing it down. But take that carefully and take that cautiously. We also have to think about soft skills. So not just the technical skills. How, will this, how well will this individual fit in with their particular role and their particular job? What's their communication skills like? And so when we're, we're developing this process, we have to be thinking about how are we going to vet soft skills? Soft skills are much more difficult to kind of vet uh, effectively during uh, the hiring process and the finding process. Technical skills are a little bit easier to um, bet that way. So the soft skills generally refer, and when I say that, uh, how well that individual can communicate and work effectively with others. Uh, you can vet some of that with interview questions to help determine the individual's ability to communicate and work with others. You can have relationship type questions. You can have problem set type questions and see how the individual responds to those types of questions. That can be really helpful in the job interviews, kind of seeing how they respond to that. Um, an example of using uh, uh, it in a construction type business, think about how much is actually accomplished by the work of only one person without the help of others, right? When we think about soft skills in construction, there's a lot of technical skills that goes on, but you need to do it working with others, subcontractors, suppliers, individual tradespeople. There's a lot of coordination that's involved. And so it plays a large role in the ability of the company to work in teams and to get that information across uh, to the various players that are involved in the projects and how do these employees interact with each other and how they'll be worked work with each other and the culture that that company has really you're getting into the soft skill interactions when we're talking about uh, the culture and that'll that'll play back to how well we're able to implement uh, the various strategies and goals that the company has uh, which may be very technical in nature uh, but a lot of it is being pulled from the ability of the soft skills to get things done. So um, that's part of the, the process that you have to think about. And you can think about groups that you've worked with on assignments at the university, perhaps, or in uh, you know, the work world, and how well some groups worked with each other and how well some groups maybe didn't work so well together. And what were some of the key differences? Uh, within that. A lot of it, when you go do group work in projects uh, in uh, university courses, uh, very often the first time, few times you work in a group, it, you don't really hit it off with everybody. Uh, and then if you switch groups and adjust groups, then all of a sudden you hit a group that you want to stay with course after course. You even select courses based on uh, your groups staying together very often. That happens uh, because you work well together. So working in teams and groups is an important part of how, do the, how are the soft skills working within those team members. And sometimes, it's, sometimes that particular group might not work if you, as well if you change it up with other people. So it's also coordination of the groups and how well they interact. So applicants' qualifications, uh, experience, they're academic, as I said, you have to look at that. You have to look at references, uh, verification. You want to make sure that you've checked it. People often will give, uh, you know, uh, academic qualifications and maybe it's true, maybe it's not true. So you have to be very cautious of that. I've had people, although there's freedom of information with colleges and universities, I've had employers call me and say, what kind of people are you graduating out of this, you know, college, uh, uh, and uh, they don't have uh, any skills. Uh, and usually my response is, did you check whether they graduated? Well, they said it on their resume. And I'll repeat, did you check whether they actually graduated? I'm not going to tell you whether they did or they didn't, although in the case of a couple of them, I knew they didn't. Um, but they never really sort of followed up. They just assumed it to be true. 
so there's a lot of uh, that kind of uh, information that floats out. So it's good to check. References. References is very interesting. You know, with references, did you actually ask some probing questions when you talk to a reference? So references are usually when you're just near the end and you're about to hire the person. This is your kind of like your final checkoff. And I've had people phone me for references. I had one family member that I recall, and it's kind of a funny thing because I was kind of thinking, I don't want to lie. And I know this person is not exactly the, the most trustworthy, hardworking individual. And they phoned me and they were, you know, asking questions. So I thought, you know what, I'm going to think of this individual on their best day and I'll see how the questions go. And so the questions were pretty easy to think of that person on their best day and respond to them. And the person really didn't ask any probing questions. So uh, it was interesting. They just said, okay, that's great. Two or three, you know, two or three minutes and that was it. But if they had actually, I've had uh, people ask some real probing questions. And sometimes I have difficulty, not that I don't think the person is uh, qualified, but if I was just their professor, I don't know them that deeply. So I have to sort of espouse to that. But I, you know, I can back up what they did academically and how they were in uh, a class if they were asking me to be a reference for them. So it's very, my take is having been on it from both sides is to make sure that when you phone up and check on a reference that you ask some pretty probing questions. And you know what, if that person use somebody as a reference and they're kind of so-so about the person, well, that tells you something. They weren't able to get somebody as a reference that they could get that would really speak highly about them. And uh, so it, it's important. So if you, as a student, are trying to get somebody to use a, as a reference, even if it's a professor or something, make sure you, you have a good long conversation with that professor so at least they really know your background and know where you're coming from besides just the school marks or whoever it is that you're asking for a reference. It's worth having a coffee with them even virtually uh, just to uh, really have them really understand your, your passion about this area and that they can speak to it. If they barely know you and you're using them as a reference, it's, it's much more difficult that way. So, especially if you have somebody that's asking a lot of probing questions. So that's important. So qualifications and checks I've already mentioned. Uh, and usually it's near the end is the reference aspect of uh, the hiring process. No, usually not near the, the beginning. It's usually because the very last, This we're just checking this out, making sure that everything else is in line. So you've already conducted interviews and you've gone over resumes and you've done all of that due diligence, but you definitely want to finish this up strong. Uh, also, sometimes they may have tests, performance tests that they will give uh, on the job to see that the employee has the technical wherewithal to do things. Uh, sometimes you may have uh, people on the hiring committee that might ask job specific questions. You just got to be careful that the questions aren't so specific that it's unique to your company and that's not really fair for that individual that how are they going to know that unless they've been trained. I find that sometimes with when you get technical people on the committee, they want to ask this super hard technical question that the only person that would know it is somebody that's worked within the company for a number of years, right? So you got to make sure that it's uh, reasonable that way. Uh, it's also when you're doing the hiring process, you should have a set amount of questions and every applicant is asked the same questions so you can compare and contrast their response. You know, they, you might have to ask a few levels deeper based on their responses of the same question, but you want to be fair in your hiring practices. So the way to be fair is to ensure that everybody writes any of their notes. Those notes are collected at the end of the meeting. Uh, if there's any disagreement about why you hired or who you hired, uh, at least you have a record of it of that, and that you followed a, a similar process with every person that you're hiring. So they've been giving a fair shake at what you're you're doing. You shouldn't be all of a sudden shifting up the questions that they're much harder for this applicant than the other applicant. And if one maybe was a little bit unfair because of the question, it was more internalized. Uh, at least they were all unfair for all the applicants, so you could check how that was. But really, you want to also vet that part of it to ensure that 
it's reasonable and the applicant can answer it. I've also seen ones that are so specific on a particular software. Again, that might be getting a little bit too specific uh, on them, or at least have enough questions that you could see, okay, they didn't get that, but they got this, this. So it makes reasonable that they understand that software. They can figure the other part out. Because the other thing that you want to make sure is you've got the right uh, individual that they got a baseline of training and understanding and that they can train up to these other areas but they also are a cultural fit and they have the educational base uh, to be able to be successful and also they've got the experience from other companies that they've worked on with there's also the aspect do we do we hire full-time do we hire part-time do we contract the work out in an up and down market, it is much easier to hire people, uh, you know, to hire uh, people contract out or part time because if the market goes down, you can keep your base of full time employees and not really impact them. You just sort of impact the contract workers or the part time workers. And we are in a much more kind of gig economy where people come and go and they have contracts and they have these other aspects that that come in uh, in and out and flow with the job. So there is that truth there and that does make it easier to protect your base level of full-time employees. Uh, but you do need to have, uh, if you want to build up a certain amount of lo loyalty, you have to consider what what is the right baseline of employees that full-time to keep on. And consider that very, very carefully. You're not going to get the same kind of loyalty with usually part-time or contract uh, workers that you will with full-time employees because those part-time contractors and employees, they have to have other jobs to sustain themselves. So their whole focus can't be on your business necessarily. And is there a pathway? It's always good if you are going to have that to have pathways to full-time. We talked about internal labor markets. Well, that's a good way to have incentives. So if you want part-time people to be have more incentives, make sure that that's one of the, the quick pathways that they can take, you know, that if they've proven themselves as a part-time employee, they're going to be preferred over somebody from outside the company, let's say. So that can also get loyalty and get a lot more incentive, ex, uh, extrinsic reward of achieving that full-time position. Also, businesses have to be careful if they're contracting work out. If you're contracting full-time work out and it's to avoid paying things like Canada Pension and WSIB and other things, uh, Revenue Canada and WSIB would take a dim view of that. They would say they're an employee and you should have been paying these, these burdens of payroll to them and collecting taxes, etc. They shouldn't be expensing certain aspects of their vehicle and stuff when they actually work for you. So how do we qualify an ap applicant? Usually there's, you'll see, and many of you, and we'll discuss this in the class when we meet, uh, many of you likely have gone through multiple interviews to get a specific job. And you probably, some people over the years, they've gone through, had to jump through a lot of hoops just to get this, this particular job with this company. You know, uh, three interviews, uh, an applied test, a long probation period, a lot of a lot of hoops to jump through but generally those companies are doing their due diligence and trying to get the right people on the bus so probably those companies have pretty good systems and processes uh, once you get on board them uh, so that's always interesting you guys sometimes wonder where somebody just hires you without hardly seeing you uh, and uh, usually that's them reacting and they need somebody right away and they haven't really sort of planned out a succession plan etc in their business so you can look at that uh, hiring process uh, several ways. And usually several interviews will uh, involve different people. So you might have the same you know, boss, but there may be one, one interview might have some of the people that you would be working with inter interviewing you, maybe somebody from another department to give a different viewpoint, the boss and somebody from HR. Maybe the second in interview might have the boss's boss because now you've made it to that level and they're more finalizing uh, or narrowing it down maybe between two applicants at that point. Uh, so it, there's different processes that can be involved, but definitely those uh, questions 
really should be uh, well thought through. Uh, and a lot of cases, they can be similar from interview to interview, especially for the same position. Uh, but, uh, you know, we can get a good sense of that individual's sort of goals and desires about themselves or whether they even have any. Uh, so, you know, asking them about what their uh, future long-term goals are, uh, what they're thinking about. Uh, why did you, why are you interested in this particular position? Uh, how you can also have in the question some examples of problems that maybe occur in your job that might be a little bit more subjective to see how they respond to that. And um, it's interesting to see how people are in those situations. I've, had, I've read some interesting processes. I don't know if I would do it myself necessarily, but uh, I've also seen where the final hiring, like if you're having, say, a third meeting, uh, you meet with the boss for uh, lunch or dinner and maybe at a restaurant and the person at the restaurant, you tell the waiter or waitress ahead of time to, you know, to bring the wrong food or something to the individual and see how they handle something under stress where something isn't done quite right and see how they are in those positions under stress because that can be, give you a real indicator of uh, how they'll be with the employees, see how they treat uh, the attendants and if they're kind of rude or mean to the attendants that can be kind of a final indicator as well especially in those kind of uh, situations so uh, you can also look for uh, cognitive reasoning uh, any cognitive biases about how they think you know where they've got a past situation and they might not be able to look at it clearly uh, those are all interesting things and we'll talk more about that when we when we meet to discuss these uh, particular uh, points. So, uh, when we're, how do we judge the applicants? You know, usually there's a probationary period, and that's pretty good. Probationary periods usually somebody. There are people, and you know yourself, there are people that are exceptional at interviews. Uh, they are just really smooth. They are really have good soft skills, but they might not have the integrity that you're after. They may not have the work ethic that you're after. They may not have the technical skills that you're after. But boy, can they do an interview. Uh, how, does, how do you judge that? You have to kind of look at the person during the interview process. I remember uh, I was on a hiring committee when I was acting director. I've been on many hiring committees. And I remember at the dean at the time uh, we had this interview and it was the second interview. So it was the, in our, in our process, that was neck, that was going to be one step behind uh, the final hire. Uh, but the Dean uh, during the interview process had a question and this person that they were interviewing was so good at, at interviews. They kind of turned it around and started asking the Dean questions about themselves and managed to get this Dean because people like to talk about themselves, managed to get the dean to really sort of open up about their life and their career. And the dean loved it. And by the end of the, the interview, the dean was like, oh, to me, oh, we got to hire this person. And I, and I kind of said to the dean, we didn't really find out that much about this person. Found out a lot about you, but I didn't find out much about that person. And the dean, when they actually sort of sat back and thought about it, I was like, Oh yeah, I didn't notice that, right? Like, so you have to be, and that's where you have, if you have more than one person, because I could have been caught by that too. Anybody could be caught by that. But if you have one more than one person, you kind of get that feeling, right? And this person knew the dean had the final say, so they went right after the dean. Uh, and the other person that's not, like me in that particular case, it's kind of like, hmm, you know, looking at it a little bit uh, differently. So it's good to get different people's perspectives when you're doing that. So it's helpful that it's not just one person that's judging it. The other thing is, you know, don't just go by the resume too. Like that's why we have interviews and interviews are important. I remember one time we were hiring this uh, professor and they had done all this stuff like in the construction industry and they had, they had been successful and they were leading in sort of environmental sustainability and R2000 home building and all these things. And I was like, wow, this is a great resume. And then when I asked them during the interview, why, why do you want to teach? Why do you want to be a professor? Right? And it was, 
well, my son plays hockey and this Chesswood Arena, it's close to where your college is and I'd be able to pick them up and drop them off and give me better hours so I could just go up there and back. It would be very easy for me to do uh, because my son's a very good hockey player. Not one word about you know wanting to engage people and advance students and help them in their careers. That no, so it was I was kind of disheartened by that, right? Uh, so, uh, but at least the person was honest, so I knew at least where they stood. Because that's the other thing you you don't. It's harder to draw it out from somebody that's very clever giving an interview. So that's why we have probationary periods. So if we did make a wrong decision, there's typically an opportunity for the higher to not go through finalized. Particularly in unionized environments, it's very important that there's probationary periods because it's very hard if a person passes that uh, probationary period for them to um, be let go. Because now you're, you know, unless there's a, you're letting go just on the junior person, but it's it's very difficult uh, in those situations. So probationary periods make it much more easier for a firm to make that decision. Canada's not really hire at will. A lot of places in the United States, a lot of states, it's hire at will. So at any time they can let you go. Any company in Canada can do that too, but there tends to be more litigation and payouts and things of that nature that get involved in it. So if you're going to let somebody go, uh, and it's not because there's a lack of work, lack of work, you can always do that. Uh, you better have some good documentation in place. So probationary periods are helpful for that, for those purposes. And I've even had where I hired somebody and they just made it through probation. And this was in a unionized environment, teaching environment. And next thing you know, I had a grievance against me. And it was like, just finished the probationary period. So this person was stellar before. And then after a probation period, they all of a sudden were difficult to deal with. So there are people that know how to game the system as well. But again, we're minimizing these. So if you, they're the, the outliers, then that's fine. You're always going to have some outliers. You just don't want it to be a bigger uh, situation. That will negatively impact your business. So, uh, of course, we can't, you know, there's a lot of when we're hiring, you know, we can't have discriminatory practices um, or, you know, saying that they're all of a certain ethnicity, therefore they should all be the same. These are, you can't have uh, discriminatory, discriminatory practices. And again, there's a lot of laws and regulations that will preclude that and that people can appeal to in those particular cases. Um, so with the Employment Standards Act and uh, those situations, there's a lot of opportunities for uh, protections to be in place for people. Doesn't mean these things don't happen though. So uh, employers with interviews, you also have to be careful that you, if you're hiring somebody, you gotta remember a lot of times that individual might be leaving a company to come to your company. So they might be giving up a very good job. So you can't sort of sell a bill of goods that's not true. You should be selling a bill of goods that represents what the business is about. Uh, so that could also lead to litigation too. This person left this other job to come to work with you and there were certain promises made and you didn't keep them. Because there is this temptation when you're recruiting. And sometimes, to be quite honest, when you're trying to get the best, the best has alternatives. The best has jobs already. The best is knows that they're really good at things. So there's a temptation for you to oversell and attract that individual and then they may be very dissatisfied when they start because they had you set the wrong expectations and we talked about expectations earlier in the course right uh, so you want to try to do that and have as i mentioned similar processes so that honest comparisons can be made so that we're not discriminating against anybody and that's a fair process and who's typically involved Usually direct manager, HR representative, if it's a larger business, smaller business, it may not be. Uh, peers, so that they, they, can see, they can ask questions and they can give input what they feel about that. And maybe somebody, if it's a larger firm from a different department or a different division, so they can give a different outside view uh, of that. Because sometimes you're in your own world when you're hiring and you're not. Somebody from outside can see something that you won't see. So that's why you'll see that uh, that uh, occurs. But there's many variables that's possible in the process. 
So when we think about hiring, I think about uh, Jim Collins wrote another book called How the Mighty Fall. He wrote it like in 2008 or 9 uh, during the financial crisis. And he said, no company can consistently grow revenues faster than its ability to get enough of the right people to implement that growth and still become a great company. So one of the tragedies that Collins says is that as companies grow and they, they meet explosive growth, they often hire people they shouldn't hire. And then when that occurs, uh, then the company starts to um, fail. So you got this growth uh, stage one, you got uh, where it's above me here, hubris, you're successful, things are going, growing like crazy, everybody's excited, undisciplined uh, pursuit of more, just trying to grow as fast as you possibly can. And you're really, you're peeking out, but you're denying there's any kind of risk. This is going to go on forever. And then all of a sudden, you've hired enough people that they're not really the right people. And they start mismanaging things. There's problems occurring. You're, you're losing clients. And so it starts this downward spiral, which is difficult to um, pull out of. So this is something that Collins mentions uh, occurs with a lot of companies when we talk how the mighty fall, this darling all of a sudden becomes uh, caustic and starts to fail. So hiring the right people is a very, very important part of the process. We also have, uh, when we do hire people, we do have to train and develop people. So we can think of job specific training uh, that we train on for and usually peers can assist with that or your boss, whoever you're working with. Uh, if it's something that's repeated a lot, you can develop a program, a training program. You can have online materials in combination with material that's done on site. Uh, and you want to support training as a business. Uh, there's this job specific training, but then there's more generalized training that helps to support the internal labor market aspect that we've been discussing so that people can move up different pathways within the business. Uh, sometimes companies will uh, develop partnerships with uh, things like University of Toronto or colleges, etc. So they develop some partnerships. It's why you have uh, where you see that they have hiring uh, committees and they have uh, job fairs at the university and things like that. Uh, you have co-op programs. Those kind of things are developed in partnership and it's a win-win, right? Uh, the college or university gets to partner with uh, business. They get to share information. Uh, they get hot, their students get hired and the, the businesses benefit because they get a pathway to on board people right and they get to look at people if there's a co-op ahead of time so it's almost like a preliminary probation so uh, there's also some companies that they have in-house training uh, general electric had their in-house university programs that they develop some of the big banks in canada have that and it can fast track people for promotions which can be really helpful so training and development job specific training uh, can be developed for clearly defined positions, uh, uh, that's the repetitive process, uh, as I was mentioning, and uh, it's, it's more difficult where it's not so specific and it's more subjective, qualitative than quantitative. Training programs can also be set up to give employees a broader view of the business and to assist in developing networks across divisions along with a better understanding of other job roles. One of the goals of this type of program is to enhance communication across divisions and provide opportunities that we were discussing for internal labor markets uh, and uh, the laddering that goes in between uh, divisions. So uh, some firms are better at this than others. Uh, and again, the larger firms are better at it than typically the smaller firms. There's also the, the aspect of just allowing people to have the opportunity to do advance themselves outside of the business so they can advance themselves outside of the business in other programs university programs uh, online programs etc and then where they need some time off to support that time off 
uh, for them and sponsor them in the way that maybe they pay 50% of their tuition, maybe they pay all of their tuition, whatever that might be, uh, to encourage them on the continuous learning. You've got employees that are continuously learning, that's going to benefit your business. Going back to Deming's 14 points, Deming saw that you know in the 1960s and 1970s, the importance of having employees that are lifelong learners is only going to benefit the continuous improvement aspect. If you're not continuously improving yourself, how are you going to continuously improve the business? It's, they go hand in hand together. So companies that miss that, miss the boat. So there's a lot of uh, upside with that and you know the partnering aspect that I was uh, mentioning already. So I think I've kind of uh, covered that. So usually there's a lot of upside potential. Sometimes, sometimes the problem is when there's an economic downfall, then these things go by the wayside. And so you kind of, if you're not hiring people or new people, why do we need to keep these partnerships going? So it kind of uh, interrupts that flow. And sometimes it's difficult to get back into that flow after when things pick up, after the economic downturn has revived itself. And in-house training programs, that can be developed specially for a company that needs specialized training. You know, you're weak in uh, project management, planning and scheduling, then we're going to develop, we need to develop a program that. So you hire a consultant, they help you to develop a program, and then you deliver it internally. You can do these things online or you can do them in person. Sometimes it can be a catalyst for improvement and sharing of knowledge between very experienced people and junior people if you do it right and you sort of have meeting groups and discussion questions you can really dig down into the problems that a specific company is having and then you can change the culture and improve things and share those experiences and look for answers and results that can catapult that company arrest above the other companies so we talked about strengths weight strengths strengths weight weaknesses opportunities and threats i think i'm talking too long Strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. So as a business, uh, if you have certain weaknesses or threats, this could be a great opportunity to build them up and change it to, an op uh, to uh, a strength and capitalize on something that was a threat and change it into an opportunity. So training and development, in-house training can have that, that specially, specialized opportunity to be successful at that. So I think some things to think about uh, before we meet synchronously, you can, where have you seen the following use for training and development and think about them. And we can have some really good discussions and get into some of the meat on that when we meet to um, discuss uh, this particular uh, lecture. So I hope everybody's enjoyed this uh, uh, quick uh, lecture on the hiring process, training, development, and think about how you've been hired. Think about interview processes that you've been involved in. Reflect on some of these points and it makes it more sticky when you do that. So I'm looking forward to when we meet synchronously and we can uh, uh, dig into some of these topics. So I'm Tom Stevenson signing off for now and I'll see you soon.